From Nashville, this is William Henry filling in for Whitley Strieber. This is Dreamland. Welcome, everyone. Every now and then, a very special guest comes along on Dreamland, and today we're fortunate to have two special guests. They're special because they've been laying it all on the line, holding back nothing in their quest to reveal an immense secret. Their names are Bruce Burgess and Renee Barnett, two veteran filmmakers with a long list of major production credits. They were known for their reports and investigations into a wide range of mysteries, conspiracies, and cover-ups. Renee Barnett is a former print journalist, radio broadcaster, and television producer whose credits include some of the pioneering factual series of the last decade, including Ripley's Believe It or Not and Strange Universe, as well as multiple documentaries together with Bruce. Since his award-winning expose on Area 51 back in 1996, Bruce has both written, directed, and hosted a series of well-known investigative documentary specials on subjects as diverse as ancient history to alien abductions, from the British family to the CIA MK Ultra project to Al-Qaeda. His recent films include In Search of the Holy Grail, Muta Triangle Solved, Network of Terror, and Bigfootville. When Bruce was introduced to the mystery of Renle Chateau, and what was described to him as, quote, the greatest game of all, unquote, or a battle for the souls of mankind, he turned his skills towards that mystery. Now, their film Bloodline is preparing to become a major new front in this battle and a revelation of the secrets of Renle Chateau. The tagline for the film says it all, never fear the truth. You can see clips at bloodlinethemovie.com. Here to talk about their investigation into the great battle for our souls are Renee Barnett and Bruce Burgess. Renee, Burnett, Bruce, welcome to Dreamland. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for having us. Hey, it's it's really great having you here. I have to tell everybody that we had an, an opportunity to meet in Renle Chateau back in June. And uh, it was actually, Bruce, I have to tell you, both of you, Renee, Bruce, it was one of my perfect Renle Chateau moments that took place that evening when we had an opportunity to listen to uh, local author John Luke Robin and Henry Lincoln's talk, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed sitting in the back of the room with you guys, sipping beers, you're smoking a cigar, Bruce. It was just that perfect night, and then I loved it when they opened the mic to questions, and Bruce, you were like the troublemaker in the back of the class, <laughs> lobbing loaded questions at the teacher, so... I, I just want everybody to know that you you approach this mystery with a tremendous background of esoteric studies, UFO studies, and you also have a, this very unique point of view. So I thought if you wouldn't mind, we could begin by tracing the journey that you all have taken to the top of the mountain at Renle Chateau. So why don't we go back just for a moment and talk about how your interest evolved in Area 51 and the UFO abduction area and those sorts of things. Well, um, as you may or may not know, I, I was the former managing editor of UFO Magazine, so that's how my uh, interest sort of culminated in the UFO field and sort of the paranormal. Uh, I, After doing print journalism for a little while, I went into television, and after being involved in that for some time, I met Bruce on a, on a project that we both came to uh, working for another company. And we realized that we had some really similar interests, including Renle Chateau, and which I'd been interested in since '82, at reading Holy Blood, Holy Grail. Of course, like just about everybody else that mm -hmm. comes to this mystery at one time or another, they come across that book. And uh, so Bruce and I started talking about it. Gosh, long before the Da Vinci Code book ever came out, that we started sort of developing ideas around the Renle Chateau mystery and doing a project on it. But we were very, very busy with other things, and uh, one thing uh, happened after the next, and then next thing we knew, the Da Vinci Code was out, and the whole subject exploded onto the world stage. And uh, we said, oh, we better get busy. But luckily, we had done lots and lots of research beforehand, so we, were, we felt at least a little bit ahead of the curve uh, compared to at least the people in the TV field, not the hardcore Wren researchers who we give all credit to. I think, um, William, one of the things that fascinated me, and I know Renee, was how similar, in a way, the Ren Le Chateau mystery was to other subjects we tackled, like UFOs, like Bigfoot, like the the Triangle. In other words, it was a mystery that had a long history that uh, had tantalizing pieces of so-called evidence, was essentially poo-pooed by mainstream scholars, 
uh, backed up by local people, real people, and yet it refused to go away. And I think you could pretty much say the same for UFOs or Bigfoot or the Bermuda Triangle. And so, you, you know, uh, is the mystery of Renner Chateau uh, the treasure of the Temple of Jerusalem, the treasure of, of the Knights Templar, or is it, you know, the burial place of Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene? Um, and it was the fact that this had been rumbling on. We, uh, it had really come to the public's attention because of Holy Blood, Holy Grail in, in the 80s. But actually, when we just did the very initial research, we found out that the legends of, of the marriage of Jesus Christ to Mary Magdalene, for instance, could be traced back to the uh, 14th century in the area. So this wasn't a kind of Johnny-come-lately mystery. This is something that had, you know, historical precedence going back, you know, uh, 800 or so years. Um, and, and, you know, that said, we thought this was perfect for us. You know, uh, something that, you know, the, the academics and the so-called experts were dismissing as nonsense and yet had a very, very real following in the area. A while ago, I was a, a guest on a radio show, and they asked, the guest, uh, the host, rather, asked for topics, and I proposed, hey, let's talk about my recent trip to Renle Chateau, and she replied, oh, I'm tired of Renle Chateau. Let's talk about something else. And why is it that we, ha and so many of the listeners of Dreamland, have such a passion for the mystery of Renle Chateau? Well, I think, you know, we talk about it all the time. You know, it kind of gets in your blood, uh, so to speak. <laughs> it, uh, it really gets you hooked in. And, I mean, you know, once you go to Renlin Chateau, especially, actually you're able to go there. It's sort of hard not to want to uh, go back again and again and again. It's a very, uh, you know, special place. And, and we see people who've given up their whole lives to go in search of this mystery who quit their jobs, and, and, and it has a strange effect on some people. I, I also think it's, we all, I mean, and I'd imagine you especially, William, and, and your listeners, and us certainly, we, we have this innate desire to find the truth. I, I think we also have an innate feeling that somehow the story we've been sold uh, uh, and if you like the kind of Judaic Christian model and, 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 and modern religion, there's just something that doesn't add up. In fact, there's a lot that doesn't add up. Um, and that we want to know the truth, whatever the truth is. And, and I think we're attracted to Ren the Chateau because in whatever measure it is, whether it's Jesus and Mary or secrets of the temple or a secret about a worldwide energetic grid or, or, or you know, some of the research you've been doing, that there's truth there, and, and, and I think we've been, we've been sold so much spin for so long, I think, you know, every day millions of, of more people wake up and say, I just want to know the truth, and, and, and I think there's, a, there's more than a kernel of truth uh, at Ren the Chateau. And that's why, Bruce, I, I pulled the quotes from your website that, that what was described to you here and what we're actually all involved with is the greatest game of all. There truly is a battle for your soul, for my soul, for the collective soul of mankind. And the, the knowledge, the secrets that are connected to the Renle Chateau mystery have everything to do with that battle. Can you talk just for a moment about how, how you feel about that battle today? Who are, who are some of the players? Who's winning? I think I think that battle uh, is the most important uh, thing in our in our world today. Uh, I, I think it's 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 the, the 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 truth behind who we really are, uh, where we really came from, and I and I guess you know where we're really going. And uh, certainly, people we've spoken to, and what we've come across in the film. Uh, I would say, whilst it can't be proved absolutely, there is a very strong uh, feeling that evidence exists which will pretty much completely uh, undermine the doctrine as set out by uh, Rome nearly 2,000 years ago. Uh, and that, and that uh, basically the marriage of Jesus and Mary and their bloodline, in fact, that largely irrelevant to children. What it is is the humanity, the 
the mortality of Jesus Christ as a regular person uh, who was on an incredible spiritual mission, uh, and just like you and I, was what was really covered up. And uh, I don't think, I, I, I mean, Renee might, might want to interject here, but I think the, that's really the importance of this, is that through places like Ren Neshatter and through this mystery and through the people who had contact with us and the evidence that we've been you know, fortunate enough to, to come across, I think well, it, it's not really a case of attacking the church. I think really it's a case of returning uh, Christianity, but indeed all religions, away from doctrine, which is based on power and control, and reconnecting us to uh, the kind of spiritual path, which I think most scholars and academics agree existed prior to Constantine's creation, essentially, of, of Christianity. And that now, I would say, I'm going slightly further out on the limb, but a lot of scholars are agreeing that it's very probable or very possible that the true ministry of Jesus and or Mary Magdalene was much more pagan in tone, much more spiritual, and that we, because that path wasn't followed by us as a, as a civilization, and we followed this path of doctrine and war and control and power, that we're in the mess we're in. And so, yeah, it's a fascinating mystery, and it's going to be a fascinating film, and it will sell lots of books. But actually, it's really the salvation of mankind if we can accept this and prove it and start moving down that path. I agree with you, Bruce. There's a strong desire by millions of people around the world to get reconnected to a higher truth, to a higher source for what is to come. And I think that your investigation is, is playing a, will play a, a more and more of a major role in that reconnection. We're going to take a break. When we come back, I want to talk about how you set out to find the mysteries of a mysterious secret society. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. We'll be right back. Subscribers, William Henry has a new DVD out, The Light Body Effect, two hours, and it's directly related to what we're doing in the meditations. To get $3 off on this as a subscriber, as you check out of the unknowncountry.com store, input the coupon code LB1. That's LB and then the number 1. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. We're talking with Renee Barnett and Bruce Burgess. Bruce, you set out, you say, to find the, the mysterious secret society, the Priori of Sion, and its claims that it protected a holy bloodline, the descendants of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Talk about how you got involved in that search. Um, uh, let me throw it over to, uh, to, to Renee on that, on that one. Okay. Well, we... Uh... We were working with a researcher um, out of England who is the former manager of uh, Watkins Bookstore, who is, as you may know, the, the largest occult bookstore in the world and one of the oldest. And uh, he came into contact with lots of people who were dealing in very old uh, manuscripts and books. And uh, there was one particular gentleman who had bought lots of old uh, manuscripts and who uh, our contact, Rob Howells is his name, had uh, gotten information and believed that this uh, gentleman was involved with the Priory of Zion. If not an intercore member, he certainly was connected. So we set about, through Rob initially, uh, making contact with this gentleman, and uh, ultimately he began corresponding with Bruce and me uh, directly. And then, but through Rob again, set up a meeting um, with us in a, in, a, in a place designated by him. We still didn't know the gentleman's name. We didn't know what he looked like. We were showing up at a place that we had no idea what we were getting ourselves in for. Um, he showed up. Uh, he said, I've got one hour. And we ended up sitting there for, uh, it was literally, I think Bruce said the other day, four hours. But it actually was six hours that he ended up sitting there with us. And we had an amazing conversation, and I'll let Bruce fill you in a, a little bit more about that. I, I think I just add that it, that for your listeners that you know who, who maybe feel you know 
sensing a bit of kind of incredulity now, which is, you know, how do you find the Priory of Zion? You know, they're not in they're not in the phone book. That's what I was going to ask, Bruce. How do you vet a person who says, oh, I'm with the Illuminati or I'm with the Priory of Zion? You know, I'm, I'm like, you know, on a mission from Mars, as you might as well be saying. How do you how do you vet a person like that? I, I think that that's that's exactly the question, William. I mean, we're both from a journalistic background, so mm-hmm. we we were. We wanted to approach it, and we did approach it very skeptically. And basically, the, the, the man in question we knew had bought very big, you know, had spent a lot of money on rare alchemical text and was a known alchemist within, you know, modern alchemical circles. They do exist. It's not just in the world of Harry Potter. Um, we also knew that this man had a, had a credible aristocratic background through his father, who is a, a lord of the, the realm in England. Uh, and we checked out some of this guy's contacts. We knew that he was also a 33rd degree Freemason and that uh, when you added these elements up, it didn't prove he was in the Priory of Zion, but it, it proved that uh, he certainly had a background that uh, was, it would fit. It would fit the profile of someone who would be in, in the, at the kind of forefront of a secret society. Mm-hmm. And mind and, you, you know, he didn't come to us and say, I'm, I'm a member of the Priory of Zion. We tracked him for a long, long time. Uh, you know, he didn't come to us. We pursued him. And so in terms of your timeline, this was then the very beginning that sent you on this quest to say, hey, wait a minute, we might be able to turn up some fresh particles here in this search. Yeah, I mean, we, we, when we set out, we wanted to answer the question, or questions rather, what truth is there to this so-called bloodline conspiracy? Mm-hmm. Did Jesus marry Mary? Did they have children? And we were fascinated by the Priory of Zion, largely because how would you answer any of the above questions? Where, you know, where do you start? And that there was this, this secret society, supposedly the secret society, who supposedly had evidence. It made the most sense to us to start there because they were contemporary. They, if they existed, then they, you know, there would be flesh and blood people we could meet who might be able to steer us on the right track. Of course, the question was, was it all Dan Brown's fantasy? You know, in our experience, and I'm sure it's your, 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 your next questions, you know, having now met these people, no, there are people out there, you know, who we've met, who we've put on camera, who are in our film, who claim to represent and be members of the Priory of Zion. And they, not only were they on film, but they also gave you access to private archives, controversial documents, coded parchments. Can you talk about some of those? Yeah, I mean, Renee? Uh, well, I'll let Bruce talk about the coded documents and parchments, which he's been through over and over again. But we, you know, we received letters, official letters with stamps and seals uh, from the Priory of Zion, uh, sort of acknowledging our investigation and in some way supporting it, although we didn't ask for their support. Um, Go ahead, Bruce, about this. There's something I, I wanted to say, because maybe some of your listeners will be aware of a man called Pierre Plantard, mm-hmm. who did an interview back in 1979 with the BBC uh, for the Henry Lincoln programs, claiming to be its Grand Master. If this seemed to us to be acting in very much the same way. In the contact with us, in the end, we've had several hundred emails from them. Each one uh, is several pages long, mm-hmm. and it is jam-packed with rare esoteric, alchemical, and historical information. And that and that, you know, it wasn't, it didn't seem to us that the contact we'd made with just a group of people, you know, kind of passing themselves off as the Priory, from the very first meeting all the way through to today, it's been really more the role of guide and teacher and pupils. They're the teacher and guide and we're the pupils. And that they've, tr- trying to get information out, and I think, you know, using us and abusing us maybe, but, you know, to get information out, and, and that, definitely uh, kind of helped us with their credibility um, because, um, you know, the information they have and what they've shown us in the document um, really does tie in and tie up some of the loose ends of this mystery, which would, which led us to feel that they really were on the inside of this and not just uh, a, a bunch of kind of hoaxers. Right, because some critics say that these secrets that we're talking about have simply been recycled for years and they evaporate under close scrutiny. But what you're saying is that yeah, maybe some of that is true, but you're also saying you've, you've been able to 
have access to more source documentation than perhaps is even in the film that leads you to believe that what you're dealing with here, in which we're going to talk about in the next segment, is a discovery of authentic evidence supporting this whole bloodline idea. Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I did want to say, if we've quickly got time in this segment, mm-hmm. that I would, we would both hold our hands up totally and say, are there hoaxes? Are there fake documents? Is there a game being played? Absolutely. And absolutely by the group claiming to be the prior Zion. You know, they, 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 have, they have played games and they have faked items. And I think they, they've done that in order to promulgate a message. It, for them, I think the gloves are off in their, what they perceive as a war with the Vatican to release information to overturn 2,000 years of what they see as the great lie. And by the way, Bruce, how did you react to the Pope's recent proclamation that, that uh, Catholicism is the only, the one and only true path to salvation? I mean, that had to get you kind of energized in light of what you see is going on in this great game or this great battle. I, I, I staggered, really. I mean, mm-hmm. staggered because, it, you know, I think anyone who has any sense of enlightenment uh, sees how, how palpably ridiculous, ridiculous that is and that you know, religion, all religions teach you that there are many paths to that, and it's not just Roman Catholicism. But staggered that a man of such, you know, intelligence, and undoubt Joseph Ratzinger is an intelligent man, who has studied other religions, who's studied esoteric matters, that he can actually think that. So I would hazard a guess he doesn't actually believe what he's saying. But and if he does, then I, I'm staggered that, that a man of that intelligence believes that Roman Catholicism is the only path to enlightenment. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible. It just goes to another indicator, a signal of the intensity of the times that we live in. I mean, the Da Vinci Code just really raked up so many so many feelings and so many people, and so many people are now eager to dismiss this whole concept. Uh, the, the Jacobovici Tomb of Jesus disaster didn't help anything, but, I mean, there clearly are two sides that are lining up here. And um, I'm glad to be standing on this side with you. I think it's very interesting that the of all the popes that were being put forward in the conclave that we were reading about, at least, and hearing about, that they chose a warrior. They chose the hardest man. They chose the enforcer. And I think they did that because I think they knew that that not only were they under fire, but that the you know the fire and the attack and the questions on the Vatican would increase. And you know they. They pulled up the drawbridges, and this man is trying to take the Vatican and Catholicism back to the Middle Ages, and uh, you know that that was quite a brutal time. We have to take a. I mean, I just think it's incredible that at a time when you know huge wars are being fought in the name of religion, that you know the the biggest, one of the biggest world religious leaders uh, would stand up and say something so divisive. Of course, we know that that's always been the, the case with the Roman Catholic Church, that that's the way they've always felt. He didn't need to jump up and say it right now. You know, you know what I'm saying? It's like it was a slap in the face, I think, to anyone who's trying to make peace in the world today. Well said. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, I want to talk about the search for the secrets of Baron J. Sonia and Ren Le Chateau. What did he find? Did he make copies of it? Will we be seeing what it was that he discovered? This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. We'll be right back. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. We're talking with Renee Barnett and Bruce Burgess. Guys, let's bring a a thorn in the side of the the Catholic Church into this discussion. Let's talk about the secrets of Baron J. Sonia. Briefly, who was he? What did he discover? Why do we continue talk, talking about him with such intensity today? Well, Berenger Saunier was a priest uh, at the turn of the century, turn of the 20th century, who was assigned to sort of a, the, the remote outpost of Renlin Chateau. Uh, at some point, he, in doing some renovations of the church, he found something, uh, reputedly a parchment and possibly some treasure that sort of started this mystery, this 100-year-old aspect of the mystery. Now, in his findings were supposed to have been something that was very heretical, something that would uh, have turned the church on its ear. And 
what those findings were, uh, we don't know exactly, but how our uh, findings tie in, I'll let Bruce go forward with that. Yeah, I mean, this is the, the real nub of it. What did Berenger Thornier find? Did he, did he find, which is what many people feel, some written evidence which, which undermines the, 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 the church's doctrine? It's hard to know uh, what exactly that would be. Uh, you know, kind of, it wouldn't, unlikely to have been a marriage certificate of Jesus and, uh, and Mary. Genealogies, maybe, but again, they could have been created at any time in the Middle Ages. And so uh, it's hard to know what the parchments would have been, which is what have kind of led people to the idea that he might have found a tomb. He might have actually found the family tomb of Jesus and Mary Magdalene, the children, uh, and that uh, there is this theory out there that Jesus didn't die on the cross, that he was a substitution was made, and that he escaped with Mary Magdalene with the help of the disciples and possibly with the help of uh, someone like Joseph of Arimathea, uh, who was also on the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council in Jerusalem at the time, who could, without that help, I don't think it would have happened, but with Joseph's help, and Joseph is the key to this story, they could have arranged, they, he could have done a deal with the guards, uh, and actually got them out of out of out of town. And then the question is, where would they have gone, and why why southern France? Many people ask us, and the answer is that not many people know that there was a thriving Jewish community in the area of Narbonne, which is uh, a couple of hours' drive from this village of Ren the Chateau. And so, um, you know, if indeed Jesus and, and Mary were two royals from the houses of uh, the, ben, the, the the houses of Benjamin and David then they were just exiled royal family you know, who, who, who sought out shelter in a Jewish community in France. And so that's really where the legend that this priest may have found their, 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 their tomb comes from. Um, I think I'd probably just add that the mystery of Ren the Chateau probably isn't just one thing. You know, um, it's, it's rather like the Bermuda Triangle like that, that there are, there are many, many mysteries. There is a... Uh, there's a, a mystery about the energy of the area, which goes back, you know, long before Jesus and Mary, into the into the early Celtic tribes and the Druids. Um, there's a mystery about treasure that's been buried there in that area. It's been a land of bandits and gypsies and vagabonds and Templars for centuries, and there are there are you know many many things buried under the ground, none of which have anything to do necessarily with Ren the Chateau. And and before we get back to your your journey and your quest to uncover these secrets, let's just talk for a moment about what is happening in Rennes Chateau at the moment. Bruce, Renee, when we were there, we we listened to Henry Lincoln talk about the, the travesties, the the defacing of Rennes Chateau that the present mayor is doing. What are your thoughts about what is happening there? And, and tell us what you think is probably the the worst travesty that that mayor has has done lately. I, I'm. I, I, you heard me ask Henry and John Luke the questions at that at that uh, at that, that event we were at, William. I, I'm I'm kind of confused by the whole thing because on one hand, Henry and Jean Luke and, and and some of the locals are saying the mayor is somehow part of a cover up that he's destroying evidence in the church, but they're not quite sure who you know who he's working for to promulgate the cover up. Mm-hmm. And the other, the other hand, they're complaining that he's modernizing the village and being crass and bringing too many tourists, um, which would seem to make sense to me because, you know, it's a small, poor little village that has, you know, lucked upon or th- this, this mystery, and it's come out in the last 20 years thanks to the books. And if I was the mayor, I'd be doing everything I, I can to, to kind of earn a buck, you know, in, in, in the summer, and they've had like 100,000 tourists last year. The, the, I'm not... I'm not. I'm not convinced the mayor is uh, covering stuff up. I think he might be slightly, you know, heavy-handedly uh, and, and maybe inappropriately making changes in an effort to modernise the village. Uh, which is the question I asked Henry, I think, and Jean Luc that night. I said, "Well, are you kind of saying that the mayor is working in league with the Vatican to cover this mystery up?" And you know, some people think he is, but I, I think maybe. Uh, it might be a bit far-fetched. Hmm. Renee, what do you think? Oh, boy. Do I want to get into this? 
Um, you know, I mean, politically, uh, the mayor and I are very diametrically opposed, so I sort of have a predisposition to be suspicious of him. However, you know, I just, you know, not being there, not being on the ground, I don't know exactly what it is that he's doing and why. Uh, I think so I, I don't really feel I can, you know, comment that much on it. I think for your for your for your listeners, it is worth pointing out, and this this happens all over France um, and indeed in Egypt, where you spend a lot of time, William. The locals, the farmers, the everyday people around the chateau are by and large completely disinterested in this mystery. Right. It, it, it's, it's kind of hard for someone here in California, and they think, what do you mean? They're, living on, they're sitting on this gold mine of information. And they're, they're not. They're regular, everyday people who are toying the, toying the fields. And when they see busloads of, of tourists coming in, it's just an annoyance. And I think he has to kind of play that off. It, it fascinates me in, in a way that the farmers around the Valley of the Kings in Egypt uh, would rather were for years were flooding their fields to grow corn and flooding these 6,000-year-old tombs until a compromise was reached because, you know, they don't care about the value of the kings and Seti the first tomb. They just want to grow some corn. And I think it's the same in Rennes Chateau. The, 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 the locals are, are really, they, ju they just see this influx of tourists and traffic and coaches and smoke and fumes and all the rest of it as an annoyance. And, and I think... It's going to be a very – whatever we find there now over the next six months, it's going to be very interesting because, you know, we have a – there's a possibility now that Renner Chateau is going to be put on the map, you know, big time and going from, you know, a few hundred thousand tourists to, to many more. Wow. And, and, and that's, that's going to be, you know, it's a challenge and a responsibility we're very aware of. And, and I think, you, you know, you know the village and you know how quaint and small it is. Mm -hmm. If indeed some credible proof comes out connecting this to the lost treasure of the Templars or Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene, then the world is going to come to its doorstep. And, you know, we both know that the farmers are not going to thank us for that. Right. So, Bruce, then tell us, what is the, the revelation that's going to suddenly explode Renle Chateau in our consciousness and cause hundreds of thousands of people to want to flock there. What are you saying is there that you have been involved in the discovery of or is yet to be discovered that will cause that to happen? We, in the course of our research, we um, met up with an Englishman um, who goes by the name of the Tomb Man, mm -hmm. uh, and there's an anagram of his name is Ben Hammett. And he had spent years researching um, the mystery, having seen a program on the BBC. He has uncovered what he claims and what appear to be from, from uh, kind of verifying signatures on the documents, papers uh, signed at least by the priest, perhaps written by the priest, though the handwriting doesn't match, though it could have been done at a time in his life uh, kind of under duress. But papers that were written either by his, the priest, perhaps by his housekeeper, or by uh, someone after his death, which have left a series of clues which this man, which ma this man Ben Hammett followed and we filmed, it eventually led us to a chest. And inside the chest uh, was, were three items, a small pottery cup, a small pottery uh, uh, jar, and a glass vial with, some, with a roll parchment in when we took this back to our contacts within the Priory, they immediately said, you have found genuine items that have been passed down by the Bloodline families. We're not going to confirm or deny that they could have come out of the tomb of Mary Magdalene. But yes, the tomb of Mary Magdalene is in the area of Ren le Chateau. And we obviously were stunned, but we wanted verification. So we took it all to the British Museum in London. And they confirmed along with an expert in Jerusalem called Dr. Gabby Barkai, who heads up the archaeological dig at Temple Mount presently. So we, we, we took it to the experts, and the experts said, A, they're first century, so they're from the time of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. They're Jerusalemite, so somehow they've, got, they've come from Jerusalem to France. Um, and one is a simple drinking cup that should have just been used in any domestic household, but interestingly, the second one is an anointing jar. And, you know, when we heard the words, it hit us like a, like a bulldozer because you can't talk about Mary Magdalene without the idea of her anointing the feet of Jesus, uh, either at the wedding or as, a, or as you know, in, a, in a kind of royal ritual. And um, 
we, but frankly, we were stunned. And so we went back to the Priory and they said, these are items that uh, we had, the, the, the bloodline families had held for generations. We believe that they eventually got to the Otpool family, who uh, were the lords of Wren, connected to the Templars, and probably members of this bloodline, and that before the French Revolution, the uh, curé, the, the priest of that family at Wren the Chateau, buried them in the nearby area, which is where we found them. So, you know, we'll talk more about the other, our other findings, but initially, it's possible that we found... Uh, as we've been told, at least, relics from the time of Jesus and Mary, perhaps even relics from the actual marriage ceremony of Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene, which would have been brought to France, perhaps with the family traveling with them, and then basically passed down as sacred objects, which would be revered, not worshipped, but revered, um, you know, down through the centuries. Uh, and you know, given that no one had found anything in the Chateau except kind of fake parchments for 20 years, this was, this, you know, this was stunning because at the very least one had to explain why uh, intact first century Jerusalemite relics were doing hidden in a wooden chest bearing the uh, seal of the Otpool family, a motif of the Otpool family, in, a, in, in Ren the Chateau. So did Baron J. Sonye find the cave of Mary Magdalene? And following the clues that Sonye left in the church, did the tomb man, Ben Hammett, actually recover first century artifacts that can perhaps provably be linked to Jesus and Mary Magdalene? We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to continue to pull the thread of this golden mystery. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. We'll be right back. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. We're continuing with Renee Barnett and Bruce Burgess. Guys, one of the most astonishing things to me of all of the clues, all of the symbols left by Baron J. Sonye in the in his domain, which includes the church, uh, the Villa Britannia, his home, uh, and the Tour Magdala, which is one of my favorite all-time spots I've ever been, this incredible rook-like looking tower that hangs off of this cliff at Rennes Chateau that overlooks this magnificent Mars-like landscape. Uh, that he called the Tour Magdala, the Tower of Magdalene, or the Tower Tower. As you wind up the spiral staircase going to the top, you stop at a window, a rectangular window with an arched top. And inside that arch is a cave. Talk about what that cave is and its significance to this story. Huh. Well, it's fascinating. Um I got goosebumps when you're talking about that. That cave is where we discovered it. What you you actually see a series of caves from the window. Um, it's a couple of kilometres away across across the valley as the as the crow flies, or maybe slightly less. Um, that's where we found the chest, and and that's what was so fascinating uh, to us was we were following these clues, which you know led us around the landscape and to the tower of Magdala, the tour perhaps the. Tower of Mary Magdalene, and you look out through the window, and what do you see? You see the cave. <laughs> and so, you know, none of us are, you know, rock climbers or mountain climbers. We're just, you know, enthusiasts. So uh, we set off, and you know, we we, we you know we were digging away uh, in in one of the caves and found nothing. And then just before nightfall, as it was as as these things happen, there was this little discarded side cave that we thought, oh, it can't be in here, it looks too unimportant. And then it struck us that the cave where we dug looks so similar in the, to, to the depiction of Mary Magdalene on the altar uh, where she's actually in a cave. And the edging of this little side, unimportant little side cave that you just pass and you wouldn't think was important, he suddenly went, hang on, this looks just like the mural of the cave that the priest painted on the very front of the altar facing the congregation as if, and we went, duh, you know, they're, they're, what a clue. I mean, it's right, right in front of our eyes. And anyway, we dug down there with, and we were talking about with candles and little wind up torches. I mean, <laughs> we, we, weren't, we, we weren't some hugely equipped uh, expedition. And about a meter down, we hit wood and we pulled out this damp, chest and incidentally we, we've had the chest analyzed and the chest dates from the 18th century so the whole story seems to point to the fact that 
just before the French Revolution, the priest of this family, who was the Lord of Rennes, buried artifacts that they that, that they had protected, some treasure, maybe some documents, and then, and definitely it looks like some relics. And what else? Um, well, the next step um, was it was really then you know what else? We think there's we think there is according to the clues we've got or the papers from the priest. Uh, I can throw this out to you, to you or this, that we're pretty sure there's another, there's a second chest which has some documents in it. Um, the, the problem is it's in, it's in the, somewhere in the, in, in the domain of the priest. So it's somewhere between the Tour Magdala, the Villa Bethania, the church, it's in the gardens. And, you know, many, many people over the years have done ground scans and tried to dig for it. And it, and it clearly says there's a second chest. Uh, and there's a chest with a lock on it. The one, the chest we found didn't have a lock, so we're pretty sure it's a se- it is a different chest. And that this chest is supposed to contain, quote, uh, the secrets of the Templars. Now, your guess is as good as mine what the secrets of the Templars are, but it's not a very big chest. So, it, you know, are we, are we talking about the Holy Grail? Are we talking about, you know, it's probably papers. And, it, and it's possible someone's already found it. But if they have, they've not, they've not obviously told anyone. And then tell us about uh, the, the tomb in which Ben, when they, you send the remote camera down to the unsealed tomb shaft and you lower it down there and, and you find some debris on the floor and as the camera moves around it reveals the open chest with gold cups, coins and jewels and something else. Yeah, I'm going to let Renee tell you about the tomb itself. I just wanted to say that Ben, went, you know, he, ben found these clues and, and therefore ultimately the chest by working out what he saw as coded messages in the church, um, which acted like a symbolic map. Mm-hmm. And in other words, he would connect a castle and a tower and, and, a, and a mountain top and start triangulating them on the map. And that's where he found the clues. He used the same idea for the tomb and actually found four different sites, which are actually clearly depicted in the church. And when he drew a line through them, they hit a mountain, uh, a, a particular local mountain top. And basically, he spent months and months scouring that mountain top, and eventually found a cave. And in the cave, he uh, he, he he discovered this tomb. But I'll, I'll let Renee pick it up from there. Well, when we filmed inside the cave, or when when ben, ben filmed with us inside the cave, that was the second filming of the cave. He had done uh, some previous filming several years before when he first found it, and sort of sat on the the, the whole thing for a while not knowing exactly what to do. He was concerned, you know, about the contents. He didn't want uh, someone coming in and and, uh, hiding them away from public view. He wanted it all to come out publicly. So he Mm -hmm. was very careful about how he handled it. So when we finally uh, went back to do the the filming, there had been a rock fall in, so some items were covered up. But we could see from earlier footage that there was a cross uh, in the corner or on one side, a wooden cross. There were several chests sitting around with, with different things. Some were open, so you could actually see inside. You could see treasure, gold, and chalices, and jewels, and amazing things like that. More interesting to me were the scrolls and things that you you could see lying around the floor. And there's also a gigantic book that's sort of rotting away there, but you can see some lettering on the top. It looks like an L and an O, and we've been trying to figure out what that might be. I mean, I, I can't wait to for someone. I don't, I don't know if it'll be us, but for someone to get their hands on those things, uh, just so that we can see what they are, because we will be filming it all, whether it's us actually handling or not. But um, there's also, you know, obviously uh, – the thing that most people, I think, may be interested in is there's a, actually a body there that's covered in a shroud that has a red cross on it, which is suggestive of the Knight Templar. So that's kind of an interesting aspect. And then off to one side is a blocked-up doorway, which is could be possibly the biggest uh, the biggest thing in the in the tomb because we don't know where that blocked-up doorway leads. It could perhaps just lead, you know, a mile or so through the mountainside and then out the other way. It could be just the way into the tomb, or it could actually be a way into a larger uh, repository of some kind. Could be a necropolis, or it could be a storage place for treasure. Uh, we just don't know. And then perhaps our tomb, uh, it might be might be a guardian tomb of that 
of that larger tomb because we've heard uh, rumors and, and legends about these guardian tombs surrounding a bigger, a bigger tomb and a bigger find. It's certainly possible that, that what we found, and indeed the people claiming to represent the Priory have told us from footage we've shown them of this, that this is one of the tombs that Beranger Saunier looted from, and that it's probable or possible, I should say, rather, that the blocked-up entrance leads back all the way back to Ren the Chateau, and that when you look at the footage of the tomb, it looks looted. You know, some boxes are open, some are not. Scrolls are scattered around the ground. It, it kind of looked like stuff had been taken and then sealed up and with a view to coming back. Now, that would be... That would that would work perfectly with the priest's story that, you know, he found something, he looted it, he made some money from it, um, and then, you know, obviously he didn't go back after he died or the tunnel collapsed between the tomb and Ren the Chateau. It's quite a distance, uh, if indeed it does link back to Ren the Chateau, but it's now being confirmed by several local people who we don't believe have ever really talked about this before, that we've, we've got a much better understanding of a, of a massive tunnel structure which covers several kilometers in the area linking the various fortifications that were built basically as escape routes for the locals when they were being besieged by the Saracens and other, other attacks down through the centuries, that they built this warren of escape tunnels. Um, and that's probably what the priest used to find this or get to it. Um, but, you know, we're right at the beginning now of truly unlocking the underground world of Ren the Chateau. Wow, well, that's an incredible stuff in the underground world of Ren the Chateau. What's going to be found there? It could be anything. It could be the Ark of the Covenant. As you say, it could be the tomb of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. I think it's uh, it's very uh, important and appropriate the way you're, you're really taking your time in the revelation of these mysteries. I think it's important to bring people up to speed, and that's why I wanted to uh, invite you on to Dreamland to, to let those who have not uh, heard about uh, what you're doing there get clued in because I think that what we're going to see, I totally agree with you. I think in the next, certainly before 2010, we're going to see major revelations come out of this place. It's time, and it, it, it's also important for us to, to take the time to examine these mysteries and to to see what they mean to, to each and every one of us. Uh, by the way, what did you learn from... Uh, from the tomb of Jesus, when that came out, uh, I bet you, uh, you you were probably really thanking your lucky stars that that wasn't you sitting in the in the firing <laughs> line when when Jacobo Vici's answering the questions of the scholars. Absolutely, I sure was. I mean, well, you know, we when we first heard about the tomb of Jesus coming out, we were thinking, oh my goodness, what's this going to do for our project? another one? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wait a minute, they're, they're in the wrong part of the world, you know. <laughs> so. You know, then, of course, we watched the, uh, with interest, the, the program on television and, and the, the, and even maybe with more interest, the press conference that the Discovery Channel did. And, uh, I mean, personally, uh, from my standpoint, I learned what not to do. <laughs> I think Bruce had some stronger words. Uh, for that whole, uh, that whole project, but I'll let him speak for no, himself. No, I, I just think, I think it, I think you have to be very careful on this subject when you make claims, and they made some very strong claims which couldn't be supported. In fact, the very man who discovered the tomb wouldn't even support the findings. And so in the end, the tragedy of Simca's uh, and Cameron's effort was that a program came out that rated below world wrestling, you know, mm -hmm. on cable in America and never got repeated, and it died on the vine, uh, if you excuse the pun. And I think, I think, I think, that's a, that's a tragedy in a way for us, for you, William, for anyone who's seriously trying to move this forward. Because now we meet people in the street who, who do giggle, who do say, oh, another tomb of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if every three years for, for, you know, just to get ratings, people rush out unsubstantiated claims in this, in this, in this scale that they did in New York Public Library in front of the world, then that's fine. But you better be able to back up your story. Because if you don't, you're going to die a quick and painful death. And they did. So uh, the, the release of the film, hopefully later this year, but till then, our listeners can go to bloodlinethemovie.com? Yes. And when do you anticipate the film will actually see release? Well, we're, we, 
we're hoping to release in the United States before Christmas. Oh, great. And then in, in cinemas, and then roll it out, as they say in Hollywood, um, in the early part, probably kind of February onwards worldwide. We will be on television as well, and, and it will be on DVD. And um, we're going to be doing some pretty special stuff on our website as well with clips and interviews. So um, if anyone's interested in this, which I hope they are, then, yeah, bloodlinethemovie.com, and it's going to have full de- details of all the cinematic release and uh, television all over the world because the reason, you know, we're fascinated in the subject, but we want as many people to see this as possible because we, like you, think it's, it's a very, very important story. Well, Renee Barnett, Bruce Burgess, thank you so much for being our guest today on Dreamland. We'll look forward to talking with you again once the film is available. Thank, thank you, you, William, for having us. It's a pleasure to be able to speak out finally after we've been uh, – Keeping stump for so long. (laughs) Now we can finally talk. Great job. This is William Henry. This is Dreamland. Next up, Linda Moulton Howe. You've been hearing me talk about the incredible report Linda Moulton Howe has today. Linda Moulton Howe is with us now, and she is going to be talking about the Casimir effect and the possibility that we may be moving toward an understanding of anti-gravity, which, as you know, the master of the key said was the key to our expressing ourselves out into the universe and becoming a whole new level of being. And it could be we're getting closer. It's so exciting. Linda Moulton Howe's website, earthfiles.com, by far the best website of its kind in the world. The edge of science, but the credible edge of science, more extraordinary than you can possibly imagine. Never miss a day of earthfiles.com. Now, here she is from Albuquerque, Linda Moulton Howe. Thank you, Whitley. Theoretical physicists work in their mind and on paper with math and formulas trying to understand the laws of this universe. Some of the greatest of those minds have been Max Planck and Albert Einstein. More than 100 years ago, in 1900, Planck was struggling to understand radiation from black bodies. Actual experiments forced him to suppose that electromagnetic energy could be emitted only in particle form rather than waves. Further, some energy had to be added to his equations in order to match the observable physical world. That additional energy is called Planck's constant. For that theoretical physics work, now regarded as the birth of quantum physics, Max Planck received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1918. But why did Planck have to come up with that constant extra energy? Because there is constant unrest in this universe, a perpetual motion that even excites the vacuum of space. Physicists have learned there is no such thing as true emptiness. Imagine a humming, throbbing, invisible engine behind the universe that we don't see and we don't understand, but it's always running. As long as that unseen engine vibrates, the vacuum of space still has resonance with that invisible engine. Even after all matter, light, radio waves, and fluctuations in what should be empty space, are removed in a physics lab, there is still ceaseless and measurable fluctuation in what we would think is empty space. That strange unrest in emptiness is what physicists call vacuum fluctuations. Those vacuum fluctuations are like ghostly residues of the light, radio waves, strong and weak forces that were in the vacuum chamber before all the matter and fields were removed. Mysteriously, those ghostly residues have a resonance with the matter and energy that was removed. Those resonances fluctuate and create a physical force in the space between objects. Because the strength of that force falls off rapidly with distance, It is only measurable when the distance between the objects is extremely small. On a submicron scale, 
this force becomes so strong that it becomes the dominant force between uncharged conductors. Dutch physicist Hendrik Casimir first proposed the existence of that force in 1948. An experiment proved him right when two uncharged metal plates were laid par parallel to each other in a vacuum. The force exerted by the vacuum fluctuations tried to pull those two plates together, and that force was measured. Now called the Casimir force or effect, it's become a problem in nanotechnology where that force is causing nano-sized elements to stick together and not work correctly. Now, in the latest new journal of physics comes a theoretical method to reverse the attraction of the Casimir force so that it repels. The pencil on paper thought experiment between uses two parallel mirrors instead of metal plates in a vacuum with a perfect lens between the mirrors. Perfect lenses in only the last five years have been made and proved in lab tests to actually focus the vacuum fluctuations. This newly published theory is based on sending a single infrared frequency of one millionth of a meter through a perfect lens. Then the Casimir force can be tricked into reversing its attraction to repulsion, and that could levitate lightweight bodies. Faster wavelengths passed through the perfect lens could levitate even heavier bodies. So far, no lab on Earth has tested this theoretical concept, but the theoretical physicists behind the idea think that it is only a matter of time that experimental physicists will be able to use a reversed Casimir force to levitate matter. The authors of this reversed Casimir work are Ulf Leonhardt and Thomas Philbin in the School of Physics and Astronomy at the University of St. Andrews in Fife. That's Scotland. I talked with Dr. Philbin recently about this potential breakthrough in which ghostly Vacuum fluctuations could be literally engineered to do work for human technology. The Casimir force is a mysterious force due to the quantum properties of empty space. In the 20th century, it was discovered that there isn't really such a thing as completely empty space. You can say, this space is empty. There's no matter there. There's no material. However, there are things called fields, such as light and radio waves, and they're not matter. And you can think, well, take those out of the empty space as well. And in pre-20th century physics, that made sense. You could say that. You've taken out all the matter. You've taken out all the light, all the radio waves, all the fields. There's nothing in the empty space. But then quantum mechanics came along, and it was discovered that these fields can't be really exactly zero. There's some fuzziness going on in them. There's some fluctuations in these fields, even in empty space. And this cannot be removed in any way. And it is these vacuum fluctuations, these quantum fluctuations, that cause this Casimir force. It seems as if there is something fundamental when you're talking about the vacuum fluctuations, that something is sustaining a vibration or a resonance even in the vacuum. What is that? Well, one way of understanding why quantum mechanics requires this all-pervasive vibrations in the fields or fluctuations in them is to think of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. People are perhaps familiar hearing about this in terms of particles, as saying that a particle essentially can't sit still doing nothing. This violates the Heisenberg uncertainty principle because its position and its momentum cannot be exactly known. So it can't have a definite position and a definite momentum zero, therefore sitting there, not moving at a definite position. Now, what's probably less familiar to a general audience is that when you talk about fields in quantum mechanics, such as the electromagnetic field, there's the same thing applying to them. Fields can't be zero, exactly, because if they were zero, they'd have this definite value. Everything would be reduced in the field sitting there at this definite zero value. But because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, there's a certain residual zero-point energy, it's called, that is required by this principle. And this prevents one from saying in quantum
quantum physics that the vacuum is entirely devoid of this field. It's zero in this region of vacuum. There always has to be some fuzzy presence of this field. And this is these vacuum fluctuations. And they are present for all fields in the universe in principle, not just the electromagnetic field, but there are fields that govern forces in nuclear physics. And again, all these fields would have their own ghostly presence in the vacuum. Well, there's the strong, the weak, gravity, electromagnetic. Yes. However, I would stress that it is the electromagnetic one that is causing the Casimir effect, not the others. And the difference between photon energy in all of its frequencies and the vacuum fluctuations is what? The difference is that the photons that one can detect and that we see as light are real in the sense that we can detect them, they can hit a detector and leave a signal. These vacuum fluctuations, we would not describe them as being real photons. They'd be sometimes called virtual photons. Um, it's very mysterious and strange, and I would say it's not something we understand fully yet, the nature of the quantum vacuum, what it actually is. However, we have some ideas about what it is, and more importantly, we have ways of calculating the effects that this quantum vacuum has, and the Casimir force is an example of it. And we're finding now that we can even engineer these vacuum fluctuations. But what they are is not something we have a really good picture of. What provoked you and Professor Leonhardt to see what you could do in reversing the Casimir effect so that it would repel rather than attract? Well, what led us to it was thinking about what are called perfect lenses. These lenses were predicted how to build them, in fact, only in 2001 by an English physicist called Sir John Pendry from Imperial College in London. An ordinary lens will form an image of an object. However, there is a limit to how sharp that image can be in a normal lens. And essentially, the limit is given by the wavelength of light that's being focused to form the image. And it turns out that any structure, any detail in the object that's being imaged that is smaller, finer than the wavelength of light will not be imaged sharply. It'll be fuzzy. You cannot pick out any details in the image that are closer together than the wavelength of light. They'll just be blurred. However, Sir John Pendry predicted that one could build a lens that didn't have this limitation, that would image objects to an accuracy, a sharpness, that's finer than the wavelength of the light. And these are called perfect lenses. The lens, it will be designed to operate at a certain wavelength of light. And then if you have an object that is radiating at this wavelength, you send that radiation through the perfect lens, it will focus that radiation and form an image of the object. And in that image, you will be able to see details of the object that are closer together than the wavelength of the light. And this is the perfect lensing trick. This is what ordinary lenses cannot do. And subsequently, since 2001, they have been built experimentally, and they have been shown to have this property of imaging objects more accurately than normal lenses. Leonhardt and I were thinking about ways to understand how a perfect lens operates. And having done that, we thought about what we could use this way of visualizing how the perfect lens operates to discover new properties. And an obvious one to try would be the Casimir force. What would happen if you put one of these perfect lenses between the mirrors? How would it affect it? Because the perfect lens, it's imaging light. And so even though there's empty space between the mirrors and this perfect lens in between, there are these vacuum fluctuations going on between the lenses. And they will be imaged also by the perfect lens. And the question we asked ourselves is, what effect will they have on the Casimir force? And what we discovered is that if the distances are arranged properly, the Casimir force can turn from an attractive force into a repelling force. Why? Because it's imaging the light. The light sees the mirrors as being closer together than they actually are due to the lensing effect of the perfect lens. And so therefore, 
if the mirrors are sitting in physical space at a certain distance apart with this perfect lens between them, these vacuum fluctuations, as far as they're concerned, they see the mirrors as being closer together than they really are. And if you can imagine, and this is the difficult bit now, if you can imagine pushing the mirrors actually closer together in physical space, then you get to a stage where, as far as the fluctuations are concerned, the mirrors are sitting on top of each other. And now push them together even further in physical space. They sort of move past each other as far as the fluctuations are concerned. And it is this that causes the reversal of the force. The mirrors are sitting separated with this lens in between. But as far as the fluctuations are concerned, they're on the opposite sides of each other. They're sort of swapped around the positions of the mirrors. And the fluctuations are trying to bring the mirrors closer together. But as far as they're concerned, when they try to move them closer together the way they see them, since they're on opposite sides of each other in reality, they're actually pushing them apart in reality. <laughs> now, that's a little difficult to get one's head around, but that's the picture, and that's why the perfect lens reverses the force. But why are those fields, from their point of view, on opposite sides? Because the perfect lens as far as the fields are concerned, the vacuum fluctuations, are bringing the mirrors closer together than they really are in physical space. And so there's still room in physical space to bring them even closer when the fluctuations think they're actually on top of each other. So when you bring them closer in physical space, as far as the fluctuations are concerned, they actually move past each other and they swap positions. And this is the key thing that will reverse the force. This perfect lens doesn't need photons to focus. Correct. It's focusing these vacuum fluctuations. This is the incredible thing, the mysterious thing. Even though there's no photons there, no real photons, these vacuum fluctuations in the field, these sort of virtual photons are seeing the lens. There's nothing there. There's vacuum. But in quantum physics, it's not really completely vacuum. It's these fluctuations taking place in the field, and the lens is imaging those fluctuations. So the lens is altering the quantum properties of empty space. What is the perfect lens made out of? They can look rather different depending on the wavelength of light they're engineered to operate at. One of their features is that they don't do this focusing trick, this perfect imaging trick for all wavelengths of light. In practice, they're limited to a very, very narrow frequency band. And what they look like is they're essentially repeating regular structures made of metal. So there are certain metal shapes that are repeated in a sort of lattice-like arrangement. Some of them are made, well, for these bending light the wrong way. Gold is used in some experiments. It's not in the inherent structure of the metal itself. It's the shapes that the metal takes in these repeating structures that's important. So, for example, you can make gold shapes, of course, through molds. So you melt the gold, you put it into a mold, and you get a shape. So what does happen in making the perfect lens out of gold? One of the shapes is a kind of horseshoe-like shape that's used to achieve this bending light in a strange way compared to normal lenses. So you just have a repeating structure of horseshoe-shaped gold. Normal lenses are made out of glass, and they bend light and focus things. And the glass they're made of is a nice homogeneous sort of material, right? But the perfect lens is something completely different in terms of its structure and what it looks like. Instead of being a nice, smooth, uniform material, it's actually engineered to be composed of lumps, repeating lumps of material. And this is why it does this trick. These lumps are acting as the fundamental unit in the material as far as the light is concerned. Of course, matter, ultimately, the real fundamental unit is the atom. However, in these perfect lenses, one builds structures much bigger than the atom and has them repeating in a lattice-like level. So in normal solids, you have these lumps, which are atoms, repeating. But in the perfect lens, you build much bigger repeating structures. And it is these arrangements which cause this perfect imaging trick I spoke of. Why is it that there will be a misinterpretation of how close the mirrors are and the sudden flip to the opposite? Okay. These perfect lenses, we 
found that a way of thinking about what the perfect lens does to light is that it acts as a sort of negative distance. If you view an object in water, it can look closer to you than it actually is. For example, the bottom of the swimming pool looks a bit closer than it is. The water in the swimming pool is actually deeper than it looks from the surface. And the reason for that is that the light from the bottom of the swimming pool doesn't get to your eye in a straight line. It follows a bent path. The distance between two points in space is a straight line. But light doesn't measure the distance that way. It measures the distance depending on the properties of the material. And it calculates the distance and follows the shortest path according to the way it calculates it. That's one way of explaining these optical effects such as refraction, uh, mirages in the desert, things like this. Now, what we discovered is that a way of viewing what the perfect lens does is that it acts as a negative distance for light, having a negative path length. And therefore, when you have the two mirrors a distance apart, if you put in a perfect lens, it acts as a negative distance as far as light is concerned. So the total distance between the mirrors as far as light is concerned is the distance in space. But then there's this negative distance which you have to add in and so the distance light sees is smaller. And that's the overlap. Yes, and so it's smaller as far as light is concerned, and therefore you can push them together in physical space such that they're on top of each other as far as light is concerned because of this negative bit you have to add in, and you can push them together further so that they swap over positions, and that's when you get the repelling Casimir force. And the repulsion is because of the confusion to use a human term, at the field level, because from their point of view, that swap suddenly means they're still trying to push together those mirrors, but in fact, in swapping positions, they are now repulsing the mirrors. Yes, that's precisely it. You could say that they've been tricked into thinking that they're pushing them together as they have to do. That's what the Casimir force is. It tends to attract things together. So they think they're trying to pull them together. But because of this swap over, in fact, in the real physical space, they're pushing them apart. So we have this way of reversing the force, but then we have to say, well, can the requisite perfect lens be built that will do this trick? And we put in some numbers into the calculations and we estimated that with current technology, one could conceive of using this repelling force to levitate an extremely thin metal foil. The idea would be that you'd have a mirror on the table, and you'd have one of these perfect lenses sitting on top of that mirror. So it's a very simple picture. The mirror on the bottom, then this perfect lens sitting on that mirror, and then some distance above the lens in midair floating would be this extremely thin metal foil, and it would be held in place there against its own weight of gravity because the repelling Casimir force would balance the force of gravity pulling down this foil, and it would levitate in midair. In that example, would you need a parallel mirror, or is this thin piece of metal taking the place of the parallel mirror? It is the parallel mirror, yes. It's taking the place of the parallel mirror. It's just a very light mirror is the point. In principle, you could use this recipe to levitate heavier objects, but not with current technology. With current technology, one could only conceive of levitating very light objects. What would be necessary to scale up the principles that you have been working with to levitate people and cars? And Okay, well, it turns out these perfect lenses only operate essentially over a very narrow frequency range. They only do this trick of perfect lensing for essentially a single wavelength of light. The wavelength the lens operates determines how heavy an object you can levitate. Now, making lenses that do this focusing trick for very short wavelengths is very difficult. And this perfect lensing trick is being done for shorter wavelengths. So there's a limitation as to with current technology as to how short a wavelength you can make a perfect lens work. And as I said, the shorter the wavelength, the heavier the object you can levitate. So to levitate heavier objects, you would need to have a perfect lens operating at much shorter wavelength than can be done with present technology. But in principle, if you could build one that could operate extremely short wavelengths compared to what has been achieved so far, then you
you could levitate heavier objects. And the exciting thing there is to realize that one can engineer the properties of empty space. One can engineer these vacuum fluctuations to achieve very interesting physical effects. And in nanotechnology in the future, perhaps, some very important applications. So, Whitley, it is not technically neutralizing gravity, but using the mysterious vacuum fluctuations, which we still do not understand, but now have perfect lenses to actually focus the vacuum fluctuations and turn that into a pressure that can be used to levitate. Linda, you know, that's really extraordinary, and it, it it's an idea so huge, and he speaks about it in a rather academic manner, but it's enormous. It, it means that we could be on the edge of making something that could, could for example, uh, a thing like that in outer space might accelerate indefinitely meaning that it would reach an appreciable percentage of the speed of light in just a few years, meaning that the at least nearby stars might come into our reach. And that the old construction ways of this planet for the past few centuries might suddenly, in the future, have ways of lifting through levitation through this application when they learn how to send high frequencies through these perfect lenses. And, of course, you and I and others who have looked at Egypt and Mesopotamia as possible cohabitation with advanced intelligences that already had some kind of beam technology that could lift objects, this may be where we're headed. It could very well be, Linda. And, you know, it's so extraordinary. This is the 10th of August, uh, 2007. For those of you who may be listening to this in the subscriber section years from now, which hopefully we'll still be here, the ice on the, at the North Pole is being described today as melting incredibly fast, much faster than expected just a few years ago. Our world is falling down around our ears just as we are getting to the point of discovering fundamental secrets that may save us. Linda, thank you very much for our very provocative report, folks. Obviously, it's going to be a near thing. Don't ever miss a week of Dreamland. This show is unique on this planet, and I say that with conviction, with knowledge that it's true, and with pride, because this program and this program alone is expert-driven. William Henry, Jim Mars, myself, Ann Strieber, all personal experience in our fields, and Linda Moulton.